Ladies and gentlemen, students, faculty, deans, Father Jenkins, and our distinguished guests, many of whom will be introduced later, but Professor Anant Rambashan, University Trustee Ann Thompson, Professor Julie Rubio, Your Excellency, Bishop McElroy. Good afternoon and happy Easter. Or should I say, Happy National Championship! <laughs> because you have been welcomed back to Easter, not just to Notre Dame, but to the home of newly reigning national champion teams in women's basketball and fencing. And we'll find out this weekend if the mother of God likes ice skating, right? <laughs> so, I'm Father Kevin Sandberg, a Holy Cross priest, a faculty member and executive director of the Center for Social Concerns. I thank you all for joining us in this symposium on the occasion of the fifth anniversary of Pope Francis's election. I want to thank especially co-sponsors for your collaboration in bringing this symposium together the Keough School of Global Affairs under the leadership of Professor Scott Appleby, the Maryland Keough Dean of the Keough School, the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism under the direction of Professor Kathleen Sprose Cummings, the William W. and Anna Jean Kushwa Director of the Kushwa Center, and the Institute for Latino Studies under the direction of Luis Fraga, the Reverend Don McNeil, CSC Professor of Transformative Latino Leadership. Thank you each in kind. One of the most intriguing images of the church offered by Pope Francis is that of the field hospital. Early in his pontificate, he said, quote, the thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. It is useless to ask a seriously injured person if he has high cholesterol or about the level of his blood sugars. You have to heal his wounds. Then we can talk about everything else." End quote. If the metaphor of the field hospital is an apt one for the church vis-a-vis -vis society, then the Center for Social Concerns aims to be a medical school for that field hospital. In convening this symposium then, the Center is asking all of you, this gathering with Bishop McElroy's address now and at 7 p.m. tonight with our panelists in addition to Bishop McElroy, to think with us about what it would mean for our research, teaching, and learning at the center and also at the university to take seriously that metaphor. Toward that end, the center will continue today's conversation this Friday at a workshop to which you were invited. The details can be found on the back of your biographical handout. As the center aims to be the preeminent institute in the academy, that provides a place to gather, form, and nourish a community of scholars in the study and practice of Catholic social tradition. We want to hear from you how what Pope Francis has sketched out for the church can become whole and integral to our endeavors, both academic and practical. So let me again thank you all for coming. It is a privilege to be together in this week, this week of Easter, this moment in the ministry of Pope Francis to examine the prospects for peace, the poor, and the planet. There is no legacy, there is no Francis factor, there is no Francis era unless we determine to commit ourselves to its fulfillment. So we take your presence here today as interest in discerning the shape of that future and enacting it. To get us on our way toward that end today, I turn to University President Father John Jenkins, CSC, to introduce today's principal speaker, Father John. Well, 
Well, honored guests and faculty and staff and students, it's a delight for me on behalf of the whole university to welcome our speaker, uh, Bishop Robert McElroy. I was told to give a short introduction, but uh, Bishop McElroy's accomplishments uh, made me uh, lengthen this slightly. Bishop McElroy was raised in a fifth generation San Francisco family, a rarity in that city. Then was educated in Daly City and Burlingame nearby. He has two siblings who are Notre Dame, who were graduated from Notre Dame. He has a remarkable academic resume. After spending time in a high school in the high school seminary of that, of that archdiocese, he was committed to pursuing a vocation as a priest, but thought it best to develop that vocation outside the seminary. He attended Harvard College graduated in three years, and then earned a master's degree in American history at Stanford. He re-entered the seminary, was ordained a priest in the Diocese of San Francisco in 1980. He was urged by the then Archbishop of San Francisco, Archbishop Quinn, to pursue further studies, and so he received a licentiate in theology from the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley, a doctorate in moral theology at the Gregorian University in Rome, and a doctorate in political science at Stanford, not bad. Uh, interesting story, he proposed at Stanford uh, to do a dissertation on the topic of ethical considerations in international relations and was told by his department chair that he could not approve that. It would be academic suicide to talk about ethics in international relations in a serious uh, academic uh, piece of work. Bishop McElroy persevered and uh, did write and uh, successfully defend a dissertation on that topic that was published as a book by Princeton University Press in 1992. And I believe it's true, this is in my field, that he made the world safe to talk about ethics again in international relations. Despite that very impressive academic resume, he says uh, one of the most joyful periods of his life was serving as a pastor at St. Gregory's Parish in San Mateo for 15 years. He was installed as the sixth bishop in San Diego in 2015 and has been a true pastoral leader in the American church, convening a diocesan synod to reflect on the major themes of Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation, Amoris Laetitia. He is vice president of the California Catholic Conference and serves the National Conference of Catholic Bishops on the Administrative Committee the Ecumenical Committee, the Committee on Domestic Justice, and the Committee on International Affairs. We are fortunate to have such a learned scholar and a dedicated pastor to speak to us today on the topic, Seeing Through a New Lens, Francis's Quest on Behalf of Peace, Justice, and Our Common Home. Bishop McElroy. It is a great joy to be here with you on this Easter Tuesday afternoon to reflect on the fifth anniversary of the pontificate of Pope Francis and to focus specifically upon the Holy Father's contributions in the areas of peace, the poor, and the planet. I always feel at home at Notre Dame because I visited my sister and brother here many times during their college years. And this year, my brother's oldest daughter is a freshman. Thus, there are now two generations of McElroys to remind me unceasingly that I made the wrong choice for my undergraduate education. <laughs> In preparation for this symposium, the Center for Social Concerns queried groups of students to provide me with potential questions to orient my talk. A central theme of these questions focused upon the nature and the scope of Pope Francis' contribution to Catholic social teaching, the polarization that has arisen from the divergence of that contribution from existing Catholic doctrine, and the integration of Pope Francis' teachings into the life of the Church. Questioners asked, quote, what in your opinion has been Pope Francis' most impactful encyclical or writing, and in what ways did it have an effect, unquote? Quote, how large and powerful is resistance to the Pope's call to reorient the Church toward the poor, the marginalized, and the excluded, unquote. Another asked, how and how much do the Pope's writings shape the ideas, culture, and practices of the Church? 
Another, what reactions do you perceive inside the church community to the increasingly progressive attitudes the Pope has adopted, especially in the light of tradition and our social conservatism? And finally, the Pope is clearly an advocate of environmental justice, but in what ways is this advocacy for the Earth's care integral to other Catholic concerns, such as care for the poor and human rights? In order to address these penetrating questions as they pertain to the topic of today's symposium, peace, the poor, and the planet, it is necessary to examine in turn the teachings which Pope Francis inherited, the fundamentally new optic that the Pope has brought to bear upon them, and the implications that he has found in that new optic for Catholic social teaching. Thus, our starting point is a synthesis of Catholic social teachings on poverty, the poor, and the planet as they existed five years ago. Catholic social teaching consistently locates the issue of poverty within a broader and consistent dedication to the attainment of integral human development for every person. This notion of integral development is not merely economic or even primarily economic but also pertains to moral, cultural, social, spiritual growth and enrichment. The economic dimension of integral human development proceeds in Catholic teaching from the principle of the universal destination of material goods. In the words of the Second Vatican Council, quote, God destined the earth and all it contains for all men and all people so that all created things would be shared fairly by humankind under the guidance of justice tempered by charity." Unquote. As Pope Paul VI underscored in, underscored in his landmark encyclical Populorum Progressio, all other rights, whatever they are, including property rights and the right of free trade, must be subordinated to this norm. They must not hinder it but must rather expedite its application. Seen in this light, free markets do not constitute a first principle of economic justice. Markets can enhance personal freedom on many levels and do provide strong incentives for individual initiative, creativity, and hard work. In this manner, they serve the common good effectively. But their moral worth is instrumental in nature and must be structured by government to accomplish that common good for the benefit of all. In his encyclical, Centesimus Annus, the very encyclical in which Pope John Paul II integrated into Catholic teaching an enhanced evaluation of the power of markets for good, he made absolutely clear that any market system must be, quote, circumscribed within a strong juridical framework which places it at the service of human freedom in its totality, and which sees markets as a particular aspect of that freedom, the core of which is ethical and religious." Unquote. The sustained conviction of Catholic teaching throughout the last century has been that the dignity of the human person is the mean and the measure of every economic system, and that markets must be structured to reflect that perspective. In the tradition of Catholic doctrine, which Pope Francis inherited, the right to medical care, to decent housing, to food, and most importantly, to work, are not merely presumptive rights to be granted only if there is an excess in society after the workings of the free market system accomplish their distribution of the nation's wealth. Rather, these rights are basic claims which every man, woman, and family has upon society as a whole. A related concept of Catholic social teaching refined by Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict is essential to understanding the heritage of Catholic social teaching on economic justice. It is the principle of participation, a corollary of freedom within society. Participation seeks the right and responsibility of individuals and groups in society to effectively contribute to the cultural, economic, political, and social life of society. The opposite of participation is marginalization, effectively keeping those outside of society and from contributing effectively. 
Because economic deprivation so often brings social marginalization, the church has long viewed it as an enduring enemy and undermining every dimension of integral human development. It is also for this reason that societal decision-making must incorporate a sustained and structural preference for the rights of the poor in the recognition that the poor are most frequently also the least powerful in forging societal decisions and structures. It is essential to underscore these key elements of the Catholic tradition on social and economic rights, precisely because many today who are critiquing the teachings of Pope Francis minimize the robust moral claims on behalf of the poor and the marginalized that were in place before his election. Any evaluation of this pontificate must appreciate the truly new elements that Francis has introduced but it distorts the truth and increases polarization within the church to obfuscate the enormous claims on behalf of the poor which have long existed in Catholic teaching. The Catholic notion of peace, like that of integral human development, has many dimensions. It does not center primarily on military conflict. As the Second Vatican Council stated, quote, peace is not merely the absence of war, nor can it be reduced to the maintenance of a balance of power between enemies, unquote. Peace is the establishment of an order based in justice and charity. Peace is the fruit of love. When one examines the manner in which Catholic teaching has wrestled with the question of military conflict specifically, <clears throat> it is imperative to turn to the first centuries of Christianity, where strict pacifism was the dominant ethic. The fathers of the church generally could not fathom how followers of the Jesus who had called them to love the stranger as their neighbor in the parable of the Good Samaritan could possibly countenance their going to war to kill that same neighbor. As St. Cyprian of Carthage noted approvingly in the third century, the Christians refused to take up arms even in the face of death, quote, they do not even fight against those who are attacking, since it is not granted to the innocent to kill even the aggressor, but promptly they deliver up their souls and blood." Unquote. But in the fifth century, St. Augustine, who was Bishop of Carthage during the, uh, of Hippo, during the barbarian invasions, countered the tradition of Christian pacifism with the just war tradition that came to be the regnant ethical tradition on war and peace, both within Catholicism and the West for more than 1,500 years. Effectively, Augustine asked the question, what if the Good Samaritan had been coming down that road 20 minutes earlier when the man was being beaten by the robbers? What then would love of neighbor have demanded of the Samaritan? Augustine answered that he would have been obligated to defend the man being beaten, even taking up arms to do so. So too in extreme circumstances, Augustine said, Christians had to go to war. The just war tradition requires four conditions that must be clearly met and simultaneously met before a decision is made to go to war. First, there must be a just cause rooted in the defense of a nation or community against grave attack. Secondly, war must be a last resort. Thirdly, there must be serious prospects of success. And finally, the use of arms must not produce evils greater than the evil which is to be avoided by war. The just war tradition always also requires that non-combatants not be directly targeted in war. These elements of Catholic thought seek to embody two countervailing convictions about the realities of war. First, war is an enormously evil element of human existence, which is all too alluring for human societies. And second, in very limited circumstances, war constitutes a morally legitimate and even obligatory avenue for the defense of the most fundamental rights of nations and peoples. During the past 50 years, Enormous changes in the nature of warfare have led the church to dramatically refine its teaching on the moral legitimacy of war and the just war tradition. The invention of strategic bombing 
has transformed the battlefield, leading to the chilling reality that whole nations are targets of modern weaponry, tactics, and strategy. Weapons of mass destruction portend, portend suffering beyond human imagination in scale and scope. And for the first time in its history, humanity possesses weapons capable of ending its own existence. The spiraling arms race robs the poor in every nation and bankrupts dozens of the poorest nations on the globe. Against this backdrop, Catholic moral teaching has dramatically strengthened its presumption against war. From Pope John XXIII's assertion in 1962 that, quote, it is hardly possible to imagine that in an atomic era, war could be used as an instrument of justice, unquote to Pope Emeritus Benedict's questioning whether, quote, amidst the current destructiveness of war, it is even licit to admit of the possibility of a just war. The popes of the modern era have narrowed the moral pathway for legitimate recourse to war and subjected policies of nuclear deterrence to blistering criticism. The Catholic tradition on peace that Pope Francis inherited has long been on a trajectory of massively narrowing the grounds for recourse to war and rejecting the assumptions of the world's nuclear powers about the moral legitimacy of their national policies. Regarding the third topic for today's symposium, that of protecting the environment, it has a much more modest tradition in Catholic teaching. Sadly so. In a very real way, Catholic social teaching succumbed to the ethic of mastery, which was so powerful in the cultures of industrialization and technological development. While there were long-standing grave concerns about the distribution of the fruits of the created order within and among societies, and about the dangers of technological imperialism, the recognition that there was a crisis in the relationship between humanity and the earth did not emerge in Catholic teaching until the 1990s, in Pope John Paul II's proclamation that, quote, the modern era has witnessed man's growing capacity for transformative intervention. The aspect of the conquest and exploitation of resources has become predominant and invasive. The environment as resource re risks threatening the environment as home, unquote. St. John Paul II's initial alarm bell about the environmental threat was greatly amplified by Pope Benedict, who elevated the discussion on the environment within both ecclesial and global discourse. <clears throat> For Benedict, the nature of environmental degradation was an inherently global phenomenon, which could not adequately be addressed by any local or even national set of policies. He said, quote, we are all responsible for the protection and care of the environment. This responsibility knows no boundaries. Seen through a new lens. It is my fundamental conviction that the best way to understand the relationship between the social teachings of Pope Francis and his predecessors is not fundamentally one as one of continuity or discontinuity. Rather, the relationship of Pope Francis' teachings on poverty, peace, and the environment that they have with the tradition he inherited is one of fundamental continuity, but refracted through a strikingly new lens. This new lens reflects in a fundamental way the experience of the church in Latin America. Critics of Pope Francis point to the reality as a limitation, the fact that it has a South American perspective, a bias that prevents the Holy Father from seeing the central issues of economic justice, war, peace, and the environment within the perspective of a universal church. But St. John Paul II certainly enriched key issues of Catholic social teaching from a perspective profoundly rooted in the experience of the Eastern European church. The contemporary critics of Pope Francis find no objection to that regional and historical perspective. The church in Latin America constitutes more than 40% of the Catholics in the world. When combined with the Catholic populations of sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, 
which often experience the realities of economic justice and the environment in ways very similar to Latin America, the Church of the South constitutes more than two-thirds of the universal church. Thus, the real complaint of many critics of Pope Francis is that he brings the perspective of the majority of Catholics, rather than a minority, to bear on social teaching. There are five elements to the new lens that Pope Francis brings to renewing and affirming the Catholic tradition on the issues of poverty, peace, and the planet. The first and most important of these is the recognition that Catholic social teaching must be comprehensively inductive in its methodology. Specifically, Pope Francis employs the See, Judge, Act methodology that roots Catholic teaching and action consistently in the world as it is, rather than as the world as it is imagined to be. This method was developed originally by Belgian Cardinal Joseph Kajain who worked with the poor and founded the Young Catholic Worker Movement. But it has become the central methodology within the church in Latin America for discerning the call of the church in areas ranging from evangelization to spiritual formation to social justice. The See, Judge, Act method begins theological reflection with reality, then ponders the implications for faith and the gospel, and finally promotes action in concert with those implications. As the final document of the Latin American bishops at the Parasita stated, quote, this method enables us to combine successfully a faithful perspective reviewing reality, incorporating criteria from faith and reason for discerning and appraising it critically, and accordingly acting as missionary disciples of Jesus Christ. Thus, the first part of the lens, and the most fundamental, is this notion of an inductive method. <clears throat> the second element of the new lens which Pope Francis brings to the issues of poverty, peace, and the environment is a very sober and critical evaluation of the globalization that has transformed our world. In a very real sense, Pope Francis approaches globalization with the same perspective that characterized Pope Leo's critique of industrialization in Rerum Novarum, the 1893 encyclical which launched modern Catholic social teaching. Francis is not under any illusion that globalization can or will be reversed. Rather, it is his conviction that the tremendous upheaval in economic, familial, and cultural life caused by globalization requires the erections of substantial new structures of social justice designed to mitigate effectively the consequences and the claims of globalization that have devastated so many sectors of the human family. This is much like the way uh, Pope Leo approached industrialization. I think the two moments are very similar. A third element of the new lens which Pope Francis approaches the tradition of Catholic social thought is the theme of exclusion. Marginalization, as I mentioned earlier, has long been in Catholic teaching seen as a denial of the right to participate that is a major focus of Catholic teaching about society. The concept of exclusion that Pope Francis deploys is more categorical and more reflective of the interwoven deprivations, economic, social, political, and cultural, which in the real world can create entire populations that are not merely banished to the margins of society, but excluded entirely. In Pope Francis' very mem memorable terminology, such people are throwaways, discarded completely for all practical purposes for meaningful participation in the life of society. The excluded exist in every land and people, it is only in the ability of societies to cover over this reality that nations differ. The reality of exclusion in our own country is palpable on so many levels. The millions of children who go to bed hungry in a nation of plenty. The denial of human identity itself to the unborn. The racism that excludes so many people of color from meaningful participation. The prosecution of policies which terrorize the undocumented the powerlessness 
of young white non-college educated men and women who have seen their hometowns and their expected livelihoods destroyed by globalization. Each of these elements of exclusion is rooted in specific frameworks of grave inequalities of power, wealth, education, race, and culture. It is precisely because exclusion is tied inextricably to these levels of inequality that Pope Francis views radical inequality as a moral curse and an enemy of human dignity. The fourth element of the new lens that Francis brings to Catholic social teaching and calls us to share is the recognition that integral human development includes the protection of the earth, which is our common home. Latin America is the home of Amazonia, a region so rich in its biodiversity that it is literally vital for the preservation of the earth. Francis has experienced for decades the assault upon the Amazon and the reality that an environmental catastrophe is underway which can suff suffocate the earth even while it destroys ancient cultures and impoverishes vast populations. Latin America is a prime example of how economic systems that internalize profits while exogenizing costs and risks must be reformed or replaced. It is also a prime example of how a deep engagement with the environment in concert with the scientific consensus of the world can begin to reclaim the health of our common home. The See, Judge, Act method reveals a tremendous ongoing rape of the creation which God has entrusted to us. And not all of the alternative realities that the extractive industries of our nation can produce will obscure that simple fact. The final element of the new lens that Pope Francis brings to Catholic teaching on poverty, peace, and the planet is a dedication to integrating nonviolence into the heart of Catholic teaching on war and peace. Pacifism was once the dominant theme of Christian theology concerning war and peace. For most of the Church's history, it has been a side pathway, a heroic, though unrealistic, choice, an eccentric part of our patrimony which was displaced by St. Augustine's powerful logic of war as a last resort. In his World Day of Peace message last year, Pope Francis reclaimed the tradition of pacifism as a major theological current within the life of the Church. He reiterated the contention of the early Christian community that Christ's call to love of neighbor is an unrelenting way, incompatible with recourse to war. And he proposed that there was new realism for Catholic nonviolence, which has been successfully used repeatedly in major civil conflicts where violence had been tried and had failed. Francis teaches that the time in which Jesus lived was one of great violence also, and yet Jesus preached non-resistance. Can the church do anything less than seek to construct a powerful and realistic politics of nonviolence, both in reality and in the words of the Lord himself. The mission of Pope Francis regarding Catholic social teaching. The first five years of the pontificate of Pope Francis suggest that the Holy Father has undertaken a specific and different mission within each of the three issue areas treated in today's symposium. On the question of poverty, Francis has undertaken a miss mission of renewing Catholic moral teaching in light of the forces of globalization that are transforming our economies, cultures, and societies. The great themes of the preferential option for the poor, which has resonated in Catholic teaching since the time of Paul VI, lie at the very heart of this renewal. The methodology of see, judge, act, so consonant with the Second Vatican Council's exhortation to look carefully to the signs of the times has replaced the dominance of deductivist natural law theory. The question of exclusion ultimately lies at the heart of the renewal that Pope Francis is undertaking in Catholic teaching on economic justice. For against the background of the exclusion that has played out in the colonial periods and the period of industrialization, Francis sees the foundation for a new framework of exclusion in the interpenetrating power 
of the world's financial elites which globalization has produced. Nations and economic sectors ask, how will our interests be accommodated? Francis reminds the Catholic community in every land that our concern must be also how the new economic arrangements being forged in the globalizing moment will accommodate the poor and the excluded. If the relationship between the initiatives of Pope Francis and the tradition he inherited can be seen as one of continuity and renewal in the area of economic justice, Pope Francis' mission in the area of peace is best seen as one of recovery. On one level, Francis has continued the trajectory of the modern popes in tightening the framework for recourse to war and nuclear policy. <clears throat> the Holy Father's bold decision last November to proclaim the very possession of nuclear weapons morally unacceptable is a sign of that continuing trajectory. But on a more fundamental level, the initiatives of Pope Francis in the area of nonviolence and peace building constitute a major shift in orientation in Catholic social thought designed to truly empower the church's ancient pacifist traditions. Once again, this shift is rooted in the See Judge Act methodology, which looks to the growing successes of peace building and civil conflicts. It is too easy early to understand whether this strengthening of the pacifist tradition in Catholic ethics will burgeon into the type of full-bodied politics of nonviolence that the Pope has advocated. But even if this recovery of the tradition simply points to the viability and moral superiority of nonviolence in a limited but robust number of military conflicts, it will have provided a necessary complement to a just war tradition that has become ever stricter if it hopes to preserve a claim as an authentic Christian ethic. If Pope Francis' mission is one of renewal in the area of economic justice and recovery in the issue of war and peace, it is dramatically one of wholesale recreation in the field of environmental ethics. Though Laud through Laudato Si, the Holy Father has transformed the Catholic doctrinal tradition from one centered on an ethic of mastery over creation to one of caring compassionately for creation in awe and wonder. Pope Francis is a pope uniquely equipped to carry out this transformation. The first trained scientist to be pope in the modern era, Francis' lifelong dedication to the themes of Romano Guardini attuned him to the dangers that technology posed, not simply for the human spirit, but for the planet itself. The first son of Latin America to be Pope. He instinctively appreciated the richness of biodiversity in the lifeblood of the planet and also witnessed the degradation of the earth and the destruction of peoples which rampant exploitation have brought. Laudato Si is a prayer. It is a warning. It is an affirmation of the power and beneficence of God. It is an analysis of the contending forces and bad decisions that have brought our planet to a point of deep peril. Most of all, it is the recreation of Catholic teaching about the nature of the human person in relation to the earth which is our common home. The renewal, recovery, and recreation that Pope Francis has launched in the teachings of the Church about poverty, peace, and the environment are firmly rooted in the doctrinal tradition of the Church. Yet they bring the perspective of the Southern Hemisphere, the majority of the Catholics in the world today, to bear upon the themes of exclusion, pacifism, the preservation of our common home, and the massive threats which globalization pose for our humanity. And in doing so, they have produced a new and richer pathway to guide both the Catholic community and the global human community in the years to come. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Your Excellency. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the surveys we keep seeing that say that among Catholics only, at least in America, only like 30% have even heard of the Dado Sea, let alone responded, while in the non-Catholic population, we're numbers like 70% who think it's wonderful. So what is the root of the gap and what can we do about it? Well, I tend to be always skeptical of numbers, of polling data about how many percentage, what percentage of people know about X or have read X, because it will always tend to be very low. Um, and so the way I think the environmental teachings of the Pope uh, and into the life of the church and the life of uh, com common cultural conversation in society, it seeps in gradually through the media. And it takes a period of time. In none of these documents, if you look back historically, did things move extremely rapidly. Now, we do have media that, that speed up the movement. But, um, you know, if I were to ask even the group of very uh, uh, committed Catholic laity in my diocese, how many of you have read Laudato Si? It would be a very small number, partly because it's so long. It's a very long document. And so I think the challenge for us in the church is to try to find ways of making its most salient points more readily available and having discussions on them. At the same time, I find that within certain segments of society, for example, in our diocese, we, we've created a um, uh, uh, culture of creation parishes and school groups and so forth. And that has been very helpful because you, you gather to it people who have some initial interest in it and then you can build upon that. But again, most of them aren't reading the encyclical. So I, I would say one of, one of the really glaring issues, when I go to different countries and talk to people on, for example, the climate change question, we are very unusual here in the United States in our split on that issue. When I talk to people in other countries, there, there's not the same split, there's not the same level of denial. I think that's a fundamental issue. We have within our nation, just as we did with cancer, uh, we have uh, an industry which is committed to obfuscating the truth. That doesn't mean the truth is always clear and simple. But it does mean we have an extractive industry which is dedicated to obfuscating the truth on this very important element of climate change. So I think it's part of that. I think part of it too is we always translate issues now into the political structures and divisions of the day. So uh, abortion, for example, is a very important issue in Catholic moral teaching. Uh, uh, political figures who support the church's teaching on abortion do not tend to support the church's teaching on the environment. So a lot of people across the board now put issues into the box of their party rather than listening uh, to, in a comprehensive way to church teaching. I think both those factors are at work. Hi. Uh I'm Nick, uh, I'm a freshman living in Dillon Hall. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the see, judge, and act approach uh, now with Pope Francis is kind of replacing this deductivist natural law theory. And I was wondering what you meant by deductivist and how a natural law theory approach might differ on a specific issue from the see, judge, and act approach. Sure. Uh, the see, judge, act approach is, is faithfully informed, but it looks out on the world and tries to see the world as it is, and then move on to the, its saying, what, what is at stake here in terms of moral claim, or what is at stake in terms of the gospel message, and then move on to action. So it, it's inductive of its very nature. The natural law tradition doesn't ignore reality, but that's not its starting point. The starting point is you know, how, in the, how does everything participate in the mind of God? How do we work this down from the core affirmations of our faith to come down with ever more contingent principles that will guide us in the world which is itself contingent? So it's the opposite starting point. And 
uh, the, the reason Latin America has found such success in this is that it, it's rooted from the beginning in the situation that confront people. And thus, people as a whole can enter more fully into it. Not as many people can enter into, uh, you know, thinking through the mind of God and going from there. The natural tr law tradition is very helpful in guiding us in a variety and, and in conversation. It provides us with a, a way of speaking that bridges cultural divides and also within our own country bridges certain types of divides and religious divides. But, but the inductive method starts out, is rooted in reality so people can start out Broad-based people without a lot of education can start out, what's the reality here? So communities can participate in assessing that reality in a more full-bodied way. And that, so, so that's kind of the difference as I see it. I don't know if anybody else, do we have any philosophers here who could add to that? Paul, are you here? Paul, would you add to that, Paul? <laughs> All right. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more on the, uh, the political polarization you mentioned and people slotting themselves, at least in this country, uh, prior to considering uh, particular issues. And I wonder if you could talk about the church uh, and faith communities more broadly, where you see faith communities successfully countering that political polarization on the ground? I think more and more, I think cafeteria Catholicism is centered now in our political culture within the church. I mean, uh, 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 partisan politics about public policy. I think we all do this. We, first of all, we, we gravitate to our political party and we put things, if they fit in that box, we're happy. If not, we kind of discard them in terms of church teaching. I think there's a tremendous impulse to that. Also, I think there, there's an inevitable lack of integrity all of, all of us succumb to where the same action by someone of our party that we applauded last week, we, we condemn if it's by someone of the other party. And, and, and we're living so much through that now that I think it's very divisive within the church. When you ask, how do we heal that? The place I have seen it most wonderful in its healing is personal narrative. When you get a group of people together who have issues, for example, I'm in San Diego. Immigration is a, is a tremendously powerful public ish, issue there. We have 200,000 undocumented Catholics in my diocese. And, uh, and, and we have many people who uh, are very concerned about the rates of illegal immigration. But when we get them in the same room to talk about through narrative what that means, that to me has been the most effective way to bridge the differences between people. So that the, the, the politicization of it, I mean in that partisan sense, tends to fall away and you see real people, you see, the, you see issues in terms of how they affect people. <clears throat> so that to me is, is by far the best way to make progress on these things and to understand how these different issues that we put in the partisan boxes, as they take root in the, in the lives of real people and we can discuss them, that we can have a compassion that's not for issues that are not limited to our partisan uh, constellation, so. Recently, Professor Deneen here at Notre Dame hosted a visiting professor from Wake Forest. I can't remember his name right now. The title was, Is Capitalism Moral? And I think they sum up the presentation, the, the visiting professor said, it kind of raises all boats. The poverty level goes up, the income inequality goes up, but the lowest poverty goes down. And the other professor was saying, the income inequality by itself was intrinsically made it immoral. So what do you think? Is capitalism moral or can it be made more moral? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I was assigned recently, there was a book that was put out for the fifth anniversary of the Pope. It was called uh, The Lexicon of Pope Francis, I think it was. 
So I got a call from one of the editors, Josh McAvoy, and he, he asked, would I do the, art, the article in the book? It was, it's like 25 different articles by different people in the world on, on Pope Francis on a particular word. So my word was capitalism. And he not only called me and said I'd do capitalism, but he said, and you have to use the quote from capitalism is the dung of the devil. <laughs> so I had to use that. But uh, what I basically, after reading these things from the Pope, what I came to and what I believe myself is this. Capitalism, we tend to, uh, you know, it's not an abstract system. What we're dealing with is, is the economic realities we confront in the world. That's what our, that's why that C Judge Act is important. C Judge Act says, no, you don't start out with some notion of capitalism that starts from deductive principles. You start out with the reality that's there economically. Now, that reality has to be faced on all sides. You can't, uh, I was talking earlier, we were, we were talking about Catholic social teaching and, and, and the just wage. And I said, don't, just don't put cooperatives in there. For, for many years, Catholic universities had a big thing on cooperatives, which are good things, but it's really hard to build an economy on that. So capitalism, our, our analysis of the economy has to be in the real world. And I conclude in my article, Pope Francis d isn't talking about an abstract system. He's talking about we have to morally judge the economic realities that confront us. And the, the more I thought through for this talk, what's going on there with the Pope, is he's saying globalization is striking our uh, economic principles and reality in the same way that industrialization did in, in, the, in the century before the late 19th century. That is, it's, it's transforming it in a fundamental way the way of life that was there in 1793 was not was there that was there in 1893. And, and uh, Pope Leo had to confront that. And it was a radical encyclical at that time. But what he started from was the industrial economic realities of the day he faced. And he starts out with the conditions people are living in. That's the starting point uh, of that great encyclical. It's the same way with us today. Globalization has transformed things. Some marvelous things have come from it. But there are also horrors that people live with. You know, the displacement, whole ways of life that have been destroyed and eaten away at. And we cannot simply ignore that uh, as part of uh, creative destruction. Uh, we, we, we can't just go on and say, well, that was part of the cycle. Uh, and so capitalism I'm not as concerned with what we call it or what, what we call the principles behind it as I am with what is the economic reality that exists? How do we cushion more the impacts on people who are hurting terribly in all different sectors, not only within our society, but in the world as a whole? And, and that's what Catholic teaching claims. I really appreciated what you said about parishes and schools being places where some of these principles can get underway, because I think they have to happen in community settings. Yeah. And I'm wondering what you might say to us at a place like Notre Dame, what are some really practical things that we can do here in order to advance some of the lenses that you're talking about? I'm going to borrow from Latin America again, and that's the, the Comunidades de Base. Okay, with a twist. In Latin American, uh, uh, the theological tradition, the, the pastoral tradition, is based on small groups of people sharing together. But I think we have to go a step farther than that, because they tend to be, in Latin America, people from the common background sharing together. I think we have to find ways of developing uh, group interaction with some sustainability to it, among kids in the schools, among teenagers in the schools, among university students from different backgrounds where they really, and, and within, of course, the adult communities in our parishes and our schools. You know, with, with school parents, and Joe will attest to this, with school parents, you have a lot of leverage because they're deeply interested in their kids. 
And you can bring them together to talk about things in a way you can't do if, you're not, if you don't have their kids in your, in your school or in your religious education program. So it's a way of bringing people together across the natural divides that are dividing us now. And I think once that happens, now, sure, our few groups can change the world, no. But th this is the recipe for building the understanding. Because people sometimes say to me, well, the, the students I was meeting with today at lunch, they said, what do you consider the, the, the most serious problem uh, facing, facing the, the, you know, the country now? I think they thought I was going to say either you know, the economy or the And I said it was the, the breakdown of our political culture such that we, we are estranged from each other. And I really do believe we have to find a way to do that. I think this is the way to do it. That is, it is the best pathway for doing it. Because it, once you understand people from wildly different backgrounds share issues and problems that call upon your heart or, or are the sh same ones you're, you're facing or your sister or brother or mother or uncle, whatever are facing. It just, so to me that is the, both the problem and, and the best way for And our, because we have our schools and our parishes and our religious, we have access to people to help build those, create those moments, so. Thank you. Great to be here.